Hello again everyone. Today we're going to deal with India in the Axial Age, the attempt at centralization and quest for salvation. Remember we've already used the phrase Axial Age when we looked at China roughly in this same period. Uh, and we'll also uh, deal with Greece and Rome coming up next in the next two units uh, during the Axial Age. This is a phrase coined some time ago by scholars to try to show that there's sort of some baseline similarities across the world uh, in some of these big uh, central uh, uh, civilizations uh, that have centralized power. Although, as we'll see here in one of the two major themes of this uh, lecture, this unit, uh, the attempt at centralization uh, does mean just that. Uh, in India, things uh, were never as centralized at least for as long uh, or as completely as in China uh, and as we'll see uh, the Romans do. Uh, and our second theme, which is really the primary one, which we'll save for last, uh, is uh, the quest for salvation because uh, there are three religious traditions, two of which are still very much alive and well today. So uh, religion uh, during this period uh, in India uh, has had a tremendous uh, significance uh, for uh, subsequent uh, world culture. So we start uh, with the first and most successful attempt to centralize uh, India. Uh, so uh, I should sort of point out, if you don't already know this, maybe you do, uh, but India for much of its history up until the uh, modern world, post-World War II era, uh, or uh, before the British uh, turned it into a colony, and then it was uh, f uh, became free after World War II. Uh, has been known for centuries for going back and forth between centralization of power and decentralization. Uh, decentralization, of course, meaning that there's not one authority, not necessarily one government. Uh, there are a, a number of smaller uh, states. So more so than any of the other major uh, uh, geographical slash political regions we deal with, uh, India uh, isn't as centralized for as long. But this is probably the, until the modern world, uh, the most successful attempt uh, at doing so in the Mauryan dynasty. Uh, and uh, the dynasty's founder and namesake, uh, Chandra Gupta uh, uh, Maurya, uh, is sort of first up. Uh, he's on stage, uh, entering stage left. Uh, he uh, uh, came uh, around and uh, began the not-so-easy, I'm sure, process of centralizing power in the 320s BC uh, and uh, was the first uh, political leader to unify most of India, which initiated the Mauryan dynasty. And needless to say that we're not going to get into it in specifics. Uh, this required a lot of force uh, and uh, a threat of force and ability to, you know, wheel and deal, make the de uh, make deals uh, uh, to make this happen. So, uh, as uh, Barry Cunliffe, who have quoted in a previous lecture, said, the Indian subcontinent, a country of small kingdoms interspersed with tribal territories, had never been ruled by a unifying force until Chandra Gupta uh, Maurya, uh, a military commander serving in the northwestern border region uh, at the time of Alexander the Great's advance. Uh, so he's uh, he was fighting, uh, dealing with, uh, trying to fend off uh, the famous Alexander the Great. Uh, he seized power uh, and began to bring the disparate polities together, meaning bringing these uh, independent, separate, uh, smaller kingdoms together uh, under his rule, uh, uh, sort of uh, reining them all in. Uh, during uh, his period in power, much of the northern region uh, from the Ganges Delta to the Iranian Plateau, uh, and from the Hindu Kush uh, to the Himalayas, south to the Deccan Plateau, was brought under his power. Uh, during a long period of contact uh, with uh, the Macedonian powers, which means the splinter kingdoms, uh, after Alexander the Great died young, uh, but his commanders fought over his huge empire that he had carved out, as we'll see, uh, and uh, th there were a few separate powers. Uh, but uh, Chandra Gupta uh, then acquired, uh, uh, through these contacts, knowledge of Hellenistic, which means ancient Greek values, 
heralding the beginning of a creative interaction between India, Indian and Greek culture. This, uh, in many ways, uh, is sort of the beginnings of what we sometimes refer to as East-West contact, exchange of ideas, exchange of goods, products. Uh, so Alexander the Great uh, and his successors, uh, and Chandra Gupta and his successors, uh, really sort of fused the two, East and West, together for the first time. Professor Bentley, one of the authors of our text, says, uh, Under the Maryas, uh, India prospered. Uh, attempts were made to increase agricultural productivity uh, through irrigation uh, and by moving populations to bring uh, under-cultivated land into better use. Towns were built and communication improved. Trade was also improved. Uh, uh, one text to the 3rd century records the transport of gold and diamonds uh, from mines uh, in the north. And I just use that quote uh, to give us a sense of uh, the economic uh, vitality uh, and just the overall vitality uh, of this, uh, at least for a time, very thriving kingdom. The world's biggest state in its day, I put a question mark because that's the statement of one uh, scholar, uh, but it certainly was uh, one of the biggest centralized states uh, of the time period, though it wouldn't last for long. Chandra Gupta, as so often is true of uh, powerful, famous leaders, ha had a very gifted subordinate and advisor uh, in the person of Katalia, who you see here, uh, and his now well-known handbook of advice uh, for uh, political rule known as the Arthashastra. Uh, so, uh, and through that book, uh, which you can see the original uh, form on the left, uh, and the advice uh, and uh, uh, service uh, that Katalia did uh, for Chandra Gupta. Uh, this uh, uh, was part of creating an effective uh, administration, uh, allowing the governance, as we said already, we saw from a map of a great deal uh, of India. Uh, and I just picked out two, not randomly, but two uh, pieces. Uh, of advice uh, from his handbook about uh, uh, how to rule effectively uh, uh, to give us a sense of it. Uh, maybe the most interesting part of the uh, uh, Arthasastra uh, is that uh, Katalia seems to have been uh, very interested, uh, obsessed with, because that was important, spies and gathering of intelligence. Uh, so he says, a man with a shaved head or braided hair and desirous to earn livelihood as a spy under the guise of an ascetic uh, uh, practicing austerities. An ascetic uh, is someone who lives like a monk with few possessions. Such a spy, surrounded by a host of disciples with shaved head or braided hair, may take his abode in the suburbs of a city and pretend as a person barely living on a handful of vegetables or meadow grass taken once in the interval of a month or two, but he may take in secret his favorite foodstuffs. So what he's really saying there is people will tend not to suspect, he's probably right too, people will tend not to suspect that someone who's living like a monk uh, would actually be a spy for some foreign power uh, or for the for the government, you know, uh, over some citizen or lord that it doesn't trust. On the formation of villages, a separate section, different section uh, of his great uh, uh, political handbook, uh, he says lands may be confiscated from those who do not cultivate them and given to others, or they may be cultivated by village laborers and traders, lest those owners who do not properly cultivate them might pay less to the government taxes. Uh, if cultivators pay their taxes easily, they may be favorably supplied with grains, cattle, and money. The king shall bestow on cultivators only such favor and remission as will tend to swell the treasury, and shall avoid such as deplete it. The king shall provide the orphans, the aged, the infirm, the afflicted, and the helpless uh, with maintenance. He shall also provide sub subsistence to helpless women when they are carrying and also uh, to the children uh, they give birth to. So two things uh, stand out here. One uh, is that Katalia is advising Chandra Gupta uh, to 
be very careful about the favors he bestows on uh, farmers and citizens uh, and to only reward those that are sort of doing their fair share, mainly in the form of uh, you know, paying their taxes. But also it shows that uh, he was concerned, and this government, the, uh, the Mauryan uh, dynasty, was concerned uh, uh, for the, the average person, the downtrodden, uh, the poor, and that they believed they had a responsibility and took on the responsibility uh, of trying to uh, you know, help provide for them. The Marian dynasty at its height uh, happened under and partly, largely because of the ru rule of Ashoka uh, Maurya, uh, whose uh, dates uh, you see there are small r period means reign. So this is in his lifespan, which would have been a pretty short one, uh, but that's the period he was in power, uh, which is a long time in power. So uh, uh, as a conqueror, he subdued uh, East, Eastern India, uh, in 260 BC, Kalinga, uh, a large area uh, in the east, so brought even more territory under uh, Marian control. So uh, after Ashoka's uh, reign, or, or at the height of his reign, the uh, dynasty controlled a, a, a big chunk of the gigantic subcontinent. As a governor, meaning as a domestic leader responsible for uh, establishing a policy, etc. Uh, his governance uh, was, uh, by all the evidence we have, uh, uh, remarkably effective, uh, and uh, he appears to have been uh, uh, quite good at what he did uh, and committed to it. He requi required all subjects to respect him as a father figure and to conform to his moral code, which sounds by our standards today particularly harsh and severe, and that it may have been. Uh, but I think if you go back this far in time anywhere in the world uh, and study it uh, long enough, you'd see that this kind of thing uh, is really required for states to survive, kingdoms to survive and thrive, uh, and to, you know, in, in doing so, establish a, a, an economy uh, that uh, you know, draws in wealth uh, and increases standard of living. And so basic law and order and stability uh, and that's what he's doing here by forcing respect for himself uh, forcing everyone to conform to one moral code uh, uh, he's uh, uh, establishing the kind of stability that's required uh, for not only the state's success but for uh, individuals and uh, subjects uh, to live decent uh, uh, or better lives he had a formidable army uh, one source at least one uh, uh, says he had about uh, half a million infantry, which is a gigantic army for the time. That might be overstated, but even if it's close to that, it's still enormous. 30,000 cavalry, 9,000 war elephants, which were like tiger tanks uh, you know, in, in the ancient world. A spy network that collected intelligence both for internal and external security. So like an FBI and like a CIA. This, uh, again, is carrying on from the uh, early uh, uh, dynasty as well. Uh, the city of uh, uh, Padalaputra was fortified, uh, had a tightly controlled bureaucracy. There was a central treasury uh, as part of that uh, bureaucracy. Some of these ideas sound like no-brainers, but keep in mind, this long ago, some of them were quite novel. So to have a central treasury uh, was to organize uh, you know your finances uh, more effectively uh, by sort of having all the money in one spot uh, and having officials you know work uh, uh, dispersing money where needed uh, here and there from that one spot not that it was a hundred percent that way uh, but that was the goal there was an army of officials accountants clerks etc so th this was already becoming uh, for the ancient world uh, an, a, a large government uh, with uh, a growing number of employees, bureaucrats, uh, civil servants, etc. The famous rock and pillar edicts of Ashoka, uh, an edict is a, a law, just one that's announced by a ruler that can announce a law. We've already seen, for instance, Egyptian pharaohs could just, uh, through authoritative utterance, open their mouths and it became law. 
So an edict is just a, a law uh, established by the ruler at the top, uh, by him either saying it or having it written down. So uh, he regularly issued these kind of decrees, uh, and actually they were called rock and pillar because he had them posted in, uh, you know, uh, widely uh, around the kingdom uh, on sort of rocks and on pillars, uh, so that they could be read uh, and seen and followed uh, by the the citizenry or or the subjects of the of the dynasty. So uh, this uh, is another example of this guy's. Uh, attention to what will keep the kingdom together will work if you if you uh, if you pronounce some edict a new law uh, in a gigantic empire uh, and don't do something like rock and pillar you know posting of it or however you post it it won't have nearly as much effect because people won't know what the law or the edict is so this was a way of getting the word out so that uh, everyone was on the same page uh, and uh, could and would, uh, you know, at least the, uh, ideally, follow the law. Uh, there were uh, huge irrigation projects and uh, a, uh, a great deal of uh, roads, uh, a circuit of roads built. So uh, large-scale engineering projects, uh, which we've already seen in other times and places around the world, uh, always show... Uh, that th there must be uh, effective hierarchical and, and centralized power in place uh, for such uh, uh, projects to be done. Uh, there was a, a promised humanity uh, in uh, the Mauryan dynasty under Ashoka, which again goes all the way back to uh, uh, Chanda Gupta uh, at the very beginning. Uh, but uh, there's a twist now. Uh, Ashoka first tolerates uh, the uh, basically new religion of Buddhism uh, at the time, uh, and then eventually converts to it himself. Uh, but uh, his, uh, among other edicts, uh, were some that required by law toleration of other people's uh, uh, faiths and other people's lifestyles. So for its day, this is a very open-minded and tolerant uh, kingdom uh, or dynasty, at least under Ashoka. His uh, also well-known Kalinga Edict, uh, which as Michael Mann says, proclaimed his intention to rule according to the Indian concept of Dhamma, a vernacular form of the Sanskrit word Dharma, understood widely in Mauryan lands to mean tolerance of others obedience to the natural order of things, and respect for all of Earth's life forms was to apply to everyone, including Buddhists and Greeks, everybody in between. Uh, Dhamma became an all-encompassing moral code that all religious, religious sects uh, in South Asia accepted. Uh, and accepted not just because they were all open-minded, some of them I'm sure were, but uh, uh, primarily because Ashoka had the desire to make that happen, had the humanity to make that happen, uh, and the will. The height of Mauryan rule, which came uh, under Ashoka, uh, saw, as Professor Staviano says, India, uh, wealthy and well-governed, like the Roman Empire at its height, which we'll see soon enough. Numerous highways were crowded with merchants, soldiers, and royal messengers, the conquest of Kalinga on the east coast stimulated trade, and an admiralty department maintained the waterways and harbors. The capital uh, at uh, Padalaputra, uh, known as the City of Flowers, was famous uh, for its parks, public buildings, and river frontage of over nine miles. Its educational institutions were crowded with students from all parts of the empire and abroad. Uh, this kind of rich cultural life, uh, a thriving city, uh, a beautified city, great architecture, you know, uh, th uh, thriving educational institutions, uh, lots of things to do, public parks, etc. All, all that uh, uh, tends to show a successful uh, society, uh, a kingdom, uh, you know, especially in ancient times. But uh, this didn't last for that long, not nearly as long as it uh, had uh, in China uh, or would uh, in the future in China. 
uh, or in other parts of the world, Europe, which we're going to get to next. So what we see is ordered decentralization in a number of kingdoms, uh, uh, and we're only covering three of them. There were others as well. Uh, but as the Mauryan dynasty can't hold on to power, uh, things uh, start to uh, n almost naturally, in a sense, decentralized, uh, uh, but lords um, from powerful families in regional areas start to take control and form their small states. So, in a sense, India is reverting back to a, a political uh, setup that it had before the Mauryan dynasty came along. Uh, one of those regional states uh, is uh, what's known as the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom, uh, northwestern India, uh, uh, after uh, the fall of the Mauryan dynasty, was controlled by Greek-speaking Bactrian conquerors. Uh, Bactria uh, is an area kind of between uh, Persia and India, uh, and the it was about right right where Alexander the Great's conquest sort of ended. He, he came right up to the edge of India uh, and uh, had to turn back for reasons we'll get into when we, when we get to that unit. Uh, nonetheless, the, so there were lots of Greek speakers uh, in uh, this area. It was kind of the eastern fringe of the uh, Hellenistic or Greek uh, cultural advance. And so uh, Greek speakers from this area invaded northern India in about 182 BC uh, and established a, a very vibrant commercial kingdom, partly due to its position uh, geographically. Between China, between the Mediterranean, it, it became uh, sort of one of the key uh, areas, uh, one of the key kind of uh, midpoints, uh, middleman areas for the Silk Roads that we'll also get to later on as well. So it's kind of central place uh, for trade, uh, particularly. Goods are going th through back and forth, east to west, west to east, uh, through uh, this uh, Greco-Bactrian kingdom. That's what sort of gave it its uh, uh, power on it and importance and ability to uh, make things happen uh, for itself uh, because it was a major player. Again, a lot of it because of it's just uh, the luck of where it uh, existed. They did large-scale trade. Uh, centering on the capital of uh, Taxila, uh, a strategic location, if there ever was one. Uh, Bactria uh, then was a center of cross-cultural as well as commercial connections. And we'll see this uh, in other units uh, going forward, that trade routes, whether by land or by sea, also tend to be routes where ideas are exchanged uh, and moved from one place to another, point A to point B, particularly religious ideas. So uh, this uh, will be a, a common theme going forward. The kingdom only lasted for about 200 years uh, and then gave way uh, to another regional kingdom, uh, which kind of uh, subsumed it uh, and uh, went even further and made its kingdom even bigger. Not as big as the Mauryan dynasty before it, but uh, uh, still uh, a fairly vast uh, expanse of territory under the control of the Kushan Empire. So in the late 2nd century, uh, a number of groups attacked uh, and brought down the Gre uh, Greco-Bactrian state, and the most powerful of those groups that had kind of, of allied, they had allied together to do so were the Kushans. Uh, and the uh, Kushans took control, established their own empire, uh, from right around the time of uh, uh, Jesus uh, uh, through the, about the first 300 years of the Roman Empire. So uh, a lot of things of great import are happening around the world right at this time. And it's still uh, kind of in the latter years of the uh, Axial Age. A ruler named uh, Kanishka uh, ruled over an empire that at its height included most of modern-day Pakistan, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, and northern India. Uh, uh, Kanishka was a Buddhist emperor uh, uh, who helped spread the religion. So uh, Buddhism by this time, uh, partly through the trade connections, what became the, the Silk Roads, uh, uh, is an example uh, of the uh, the dispersal, uh, the diffusion of religious uh, ideas as well as products uh, uh, due to the trade connections uh, and routes. 
So uh, a, a, another trade conduit between East and West, like the Greco-Bactrian kingdom before, partially because it's in the same place, uh, it's part of it, uh, it's just, you know, that's that place now under a new rule. Uh, and the major players, uh, it was one of the major players in the Silk Road network uh, that's uh, in a sense being created. There was no project known as the Silk Road. It wasn't like building a freeway or a highway. These things came about uh, naturally. Uh, they weren't planned. They weren't planned, but they might as well have been because in the end, it in, in, ended up being a pretty efficient way uh, uh, to uh, get goods uh, and ideas from one place to another. So uh, it helped to bring stability. Uh, first, the Bactrian uh, kingdom, uh, then the Christian kingdom. Uh, to the lands uh, and the relations between uh, lands in the east and the west, kingdoms uh, in, uh, on, on both sides, west and east. So uh, m maybe more than anything else, the Kushan Empire uh, established law and order and stability uh, in its vast uh, uh, you know, kingdom so that merchants coming from far and wide uh, uh, could feel, uh, because they were safe, uh, traveling over the great distances through the empire. So this helped to facilitate uh, uh, trade uh, and uh, economic growth uh, in you know, multiple directions in many places, even outside of this kingdom. They sort of gave an assist to many other uh, uh, kingdoms as well. Not that that's the reason they were doing it, of course. Then comes the Gupta dynasty, the third of our original kingdoms, uh, a little bit later. 4th and 5th centuries CE. This is kind of just to give us some point of reference. It's a, around the time uh, of the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. Uh, the base state, uh, Magadha, uh, which you can see in the uh, map on the right, the little uh, insert map in the lower lower right uh, in blue, uh, that was their base uh, state. Uh, and they, as you can see in the orange uh, bigger map, they expanded from there uh, through conquests. Uh, Chandra Gupta, no relation to Chandra Gupta. Uh, really, that's true. Uh, same name, except that, that it's two words instead of one now, uh, but different guy. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the the hilarious uh, cartoon of 17 Minutes History of the World. I forget the guy's name. Uh, it, it actually does a pretty good job telling the whole history of the uh, global history uh, in 17 minutes, uh, but it's also hilarious at the same time. It's the same guy that did uh, one on Japan in its history first and then did one on the world. I don't know if he's done others, but they're they're hilarious. Uh, but he talks about these two guys uh, somewhat comically, but they, it is the two different people. Uh, they formed an alliance uh, with powerful families uh, around uh, uh, Magadha, in and around uh, and established uh, then uh, this thriving kingdom, uh, the Gupta dynasty. Uh, Chandra Gupta's successors conquered or made tributary states of many regional kingdoms, uh, which means that they're, they're, they're putting much of India back uh, uh, under centralized rule, their own. They didn't send out governors, uh, uh, not their own, but co-opted local powerful figures uh, leading a great deal of autonomy uh, in uh, those regional areas. We talked about this as far back as the first empire, uh, uh, the, the empire uh, in Mesopotamia, uh, uh, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the empire there saw a, a different uh, way of handling uh, a widespread uh, empire, uh, and that is you send out your own governors. So you need to send out your own governors. The advantage, and again, we already noted this, uh, is that uh, they're more likely to be loyal to you, you can control them more easily, you can trust them more easily, not that you can always trust them, uh, but the downside is they're going to be seen as outsiders by the people that they're sent to uh, rule over, because they are. They're, the governors are taking orders from the king or the emperor, uh, and he's a foreigner uh, uh, living in you know uh, a foreign land. Uh, the advantage to co-opting the local nobility or uh, power brokers is that they will get more respect uh, from the people uh, and if that governor who's from that area, territory, region 
you know, if he is loyal to you, uh, he's likely to be able to get things done more easily because he's more trusted uh, in his homeland, uh, as you would expect. But the downside is there's a greater chance that he won't be or stay loyal to you. So uh, the uh, Gupta dynasty opted uh, for that second uh, way of doing it. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it did have uh, some negative consequences we'll see in a moment. There were many cultural achievements uh, uh, during the Gupta dynasty, which was true of the Mauryan and others as well, but it particularly stands out here. You can look at the little uh, uh, chart on the left there, but the one that's most famous today uh, is their mathematical advances, particularly uh, the concept of zero. Uh, and a decimal system that kind of uh, came out of it as well. Uh, other peoples hadn't had the concept of zero in their math yet, uh, and it makes things, uh, if you're not a math person, it might sound odd, but it really does make things much more difficult, uh, difficult without the concept uh, and uh, than a symbol for zero. The Gupta kingdom and dynasty, after, again, a couple of centuries of rule, was eventually con conquered by nomads. We know how pesky and difficult those nomads can be uh, to fend off, uh, and once again, it's true here, but it was made easier by the decentralized nature of, of the rule uh, uh, you know, uh, that the Guptas uh, uh, made. Uh, again, by putting power in the hands of regional uh, lords uh, instead of, uh, you know, under more tight, direct uh, line of power uh, you know, uh, uh, orders uh, coming down from the top, uh, from the, the capital, uh, makes it easier <coughs> for invaders to kind of divide and conquer, and that they did. Now we're going to look at some of the economic uh, and social developments uh, in classical India. Uh, and so we've looked at the politics, uh, at least in a very general, broad sense. That's all we need to do. Uh, and now we'll look at trade, family life, the caste system, we've, looked, we've talked about its origins before, uh, and then, as I said, at the outset, really the most important things we cover are the three religions, Jainism and Buddhism and Hinduism, the last two, of course, uh, having a tremendous impact on the world right up until the present.